You ever heard somebody say that God helps those who help themselves? Anybody ever heard yes. that saying, saying is just me? Come on, wake up. Has anyone heard it? Raise your hands if you've heard the just, yep, yeah, okay. If you've never heard it, raise, no, we've all heard it, right? God helps those who help themselves. You know, the problem with that saying is it's not true. And a lot of times we put things in the Bible that really aren't there. And the truth is that God doesn't help those who help themselves. God helps those who realize that we can't help ourselves. That when we get to the point where we realize that we have really nothing to offer God except ourselves, then that's when he steps in and he does everything that we can't do for ourselves. And all of us have to come to that point in our lives where we acknowledge the fact that we're not smart enough, we're not good enough, we're not well-behaved enough, we weren't born into a family that makes a difference, that nothing about us can contribute to us being a follower of Christ except for the fact that he extended this invitation for us to follow and anyone who wants to follow can follow. But by Jesus' own words, he says, the only way to follow is to come through me. And so I wanna to talk to you this morning about what that means, what that looks like. And we're gonna talk about a person who came to Jesus and he came at night. We've called our message today, Nick, Nick, Nicodemus, in the night or in the nighttime. Let's dive right into it from John chapter three. For some, it'll be a review. For some, perhaps maybe you'll look at this in a way that you've never looked at it before. But I want you to know that I've been praying for you and that I've been preparing this message specifically because I believe that God has at least some here who desperately need to hear this. I think all of us can remember and can learn, but I believe that for some, it can be life-changing. So let's look together at John chapter three, the story of Nicodemus. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. Now we've talked about the Pharisees. They were among the Jewish society and Jesus of course was born a Jew. The, the, the Pharisees were the ones who had risen to, to a top, to a level of leadership. But there was even a higher level of leadership that required political savvy, that required some, uh, some clout, sometimes some finance, and always a really bright mind. And this level, you'll see that, that not only was Nicodemus a Pharisee, but he was a member of the Jewish ruling council. The ruling council would have been anywhere from 22 to 70 people. And they were like the Supreme Court for everything Jewish. He was a policy decider, a decision maker, a shot caller. And he had been trained for generations to think a certain way. And one of the ways that he thought, or one of the things that he thought, was that nobody except a very small group of people were good enough to have a relationship with God. He was exclusive. He was proud. He was judgmental by default and belonged to a group of people who were professional, professionally judgmental, exclusive, and proud. But he decided to come to Jesus. And because he came to Jesus, it begins an interesting conversation, but he came to Jesus at night. Now, we don't know why he came at night. Perhaps Jesus only had, you know, some nighttime appointments available. Maybe he only had a 7.30 in the evening and Nicodemus said, I'll take it. Maybe Nicodemus was too busy. And so he only had a nighttime appointment. I think that Nicodemus had something to lose. I think that Nicodemus coming to Jesus Jesus being a new teacher, new on the scene, making some claims that, that stressed people out, people beginning to follow him and, and pull away from the old way of thinking. Nicodemus had seen enough clearly to be curious, but didn't want to be identified as somebody who might be around Jesus. Now, I think that may relate to some of us in ways that we don't really understand because maybe some of you don't think you are the kind of person who even should be in church. Maybe you're not the kind of person who really thought you'd ever be interested in hearing things about this person you know, called Jesus. Maybe you're a person wounded by a church at some point, or maybe a Christian said something unkind to you or judged you or alienated you in some way. And so you perhaps have decided that this whole gospel thing isn't for you, but something in you has drawn you and you're not hundred percent sure what it is so much so that you're willing to step over some barriers that perhaps you've put into your own life or maybe somebody else has put into your life for you. And you've made an effort 
to begin a conversation with Jesus. And that's what we've been doing. That's what we do together every Sunday morning. And that's what Nicodemus chose to do. He came to Jesus at night and he said, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher who's come from God for nobody could perform the signs that you have performed if God were not with him. Now, you and I know Jesus performed miracles, tricks, things that he did that were outside or beyond the scope of what we think is humanly possible. But Nicodemus was interested, he was being drawn and he didn't see these things as simply miracles. He saw the things that Jesus had done already and was doing as signs, signs that were pointing him to potentially a different way of thinking, to a different life, to a relationship with God that didn't just involve keeping rules and looking impressive. And so Nicodemus was there and he was in and he was engaged in this conversation and he complimented Jesus. And Jesus said, I, or he replied, very truly, I tell you, nobody can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. Now, we Christians, we've uh, abused the term born again and worn it out in some ways. And in some circles, it has a bad connotation. You see it on signs when people pick it. You see it on bumper stickers. You see it as a way sometimes to divide Christians, followers of Christ from the rest of the world. But that's not at all what Jesus meant. When Jesus said born again, he simply meant to be born from above that there would be a second birth, a spiritual birth, where we're born from above. And he said, you can't see the kingdom unless you're born from above. Now, Nicodemus replied, and I skipped this verse, but you can read it. And he said, ah, how can you be born again? He said, no full grown man can go back into their mother's womb. And Jesus sort of dismissed him. And it was just kind of a distraction, a way for Nicodemus to potentially think, or maybe it was a little joke. But Jesus answered him again. And he said, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they're born of water and born of spirit. Now, that's confusing to some. And some preachers have said, well, born of water is like when a woman's water breaks when they're pregnant, giving, getting ready to give birth. And, and so it's talking about human birth. And you know that's a, a valid perspective. Perhaps somebody could decide that. But it wasn't a thing in Jewish society. They didn't talk about a woman's water breaking as being a sign for labor and delivery. And it wasn't part of their vocabulary and their common conversation, but what was part of their common conversation was that water was used by Jewish people for purification rituals and symbolized the cleansing from sin. And what I think Jesus was saying to Nicodemus is, is that you have to be born from above and that two things have to happen to you. And they don't happen from you, they happen for you and are given to you without you contributing to them with the exception of you simply offering yourself to God. And so Nicodemus, mind blown. And Jesus continues the conversation with this very smart man who was probably skeptical, but at least a little interested. And he says, very truly, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they're born of water and of the spirit, unless we're cleansed from sin and claimed by the Holy Spirit, becoming a new person, going from spiritual death to spiritual light, from spiritual darkness to spiritual lightness or enlightenment. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to the spirit. He says, hey, Jewish people have Jewish babies. American people have American babies. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spiritual babies. It's not something you're born into, not something you inherit, not something you can think your way into, and it's not a religion. You must be born again. Jesus says the wind blows wherever it pleases. You can hear it, but you can't tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the spirit. So he's coming back to Nicodemus and he's talking to him as a Jew and as a Jewish leader. And he's saying Christianity or salvation, being a follower of Christ, isn't restricted to where you were born or what you've been taught or how well you can follow the rules. 
that the Spirit of God saves all kinds of people and we have no control over it and no say. Now, the good news is that that means that all of us are involved now. And before in the Old Testament and the Old Covenant, you did have to be part of the Jewish people and you did have to follow along with their set of laws that were given to them by Moses. And so Jesus continues to expand his mind and expand his paradigm. And he goes and they have a great conversation from verse nine to verse 13. But then Jesus uses another example for, for Nicodemus that he would understand. And he said, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the son of man must be lifted up that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. Now, in Numbers chapter 21, there's a story that only covers about five different verses in scripture. And it's kind of a cool story where the children of Israel, they were wandering in the wilderness. And we've talked a lot about that. You and I have laid some history down. We have some, some uh, track record spiritually. We've discussed the, the children of Israel in the desert and things that have happened to them, but we've never talked about this story. The Bible says that the children of Israel had become disobedient. They were defying God and complaining about God's love for them and Moses' leadership. And so God sent snakes into their camp, poisonous snakes that hid in various places and bit them in inconvenient times and killed them. And the people were dying by snake bite. And after the first few folks died, I'm sure they didn't think too much about it, but pretty soon they realized that they had something bad going on. And so they came to Moses and said, we repent. God's not as bad as he, we thought he was and you're not as bad a leader as we, we thought you were and we wanna get things right. And so, so Moses carved a snake out of brass and he put it on a pole. Now he was instructed to by God and he held the pole up with the brass snake. And anyone who had the faith that God could heal them from the snake bite looked at the pole and the pole was a reminder of their sin and of the fact that they couldn't save themselves from the snakes. And the Bible simply says when they looked at this snake on a pole that they were healed. And so Jesus is telling this, this story back to Nicodemus who knew it, who probably taught it himself. His grandmother maybe taught it to him when he was a boy. He, he knew this story, but then Jesus says, so the son of man, which is the Messiah, it's sort of code, must be lifted up on a pole so that anyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Now, the interesting thing about this is that the Bible tells us and Jewish law tells us that anyone who any man who found himself impaled by a pole or lifted up on a pole was considered cursed. Perhaps a Roman cross. And so Jesus was telling Nicodemus that to be cleansed by the spirit and claimed by the spirit, to see the kingdom of God and to enter the kingdom of God, that someone had to intervene that the son of man would take on the curse so that anyone who looked to him and to him alone, to Jesus, would be freed from the curse, sin, death, suffering, and hell. Now you and I know about the crucifixion because we live on this side of the event, but they didn't know about the crucifixion. John didn't know about the crucifixion this was a couple of years plus before this even happened. And so Jesus is foreshadowing this to Nicodemus and Nicodemus is obviously compelled. He's torn in his spirit. Do I trust myself? Do I trust my friends? Do I trust my upbringing? Do I trust my education? Or do I open my mind up to the reality that what I sense in my heart really might be true? And there really might be a way for me and everyone else to have peace with God. Now, John, writing this stuff down, right? And he takes a step away and he's like, look, I gotta explain to you what Jesus is saying. Cause it was getting a little bit heavy for everyone who would have been any part of this. This is a lot. And so John writes this verse. Now it's the Holy Spirit of God writing. It's, it's, it's in scripture, it's absolutely true. Through the pen of John, who was an eyewitness. And he says, listen, this is what it means. For God so loved the world that only because of God's love, he gave 
his only son, Jesus. And whoever believes in him, the good people, well, the people who think they're good, the bad people, the people with the past, and the people who, well, they wanna hide their past. I think that pretty much includes everyone here. The people who think that they're churchy and religious enough to have a relationship with God. And those who, if we're honest, would say, if I were God, I probably wouldn't have a relationship with somebody like me. Jesus came to shatter the barrier between God and humankind, making salvation possible by offering it to whoever would believe in Jesus. Because of his love, he chose to give. So whoever believes won't perish. And the Greek language is very, very unique here. But the assumption is, is that by choosing to have a relationship with Jesus that will be saved from an eternity in hell and from a disenfranchised, disconnected, wandering spirit here during this biological life on earth where we know that there's something more but we live with the reality that that hole will likely never be filled. And John is saying that Jesus is offering salvation. So whoever believes in him is not gonna perish, but gonna have eternal life, which is a future in heaven with God, with the whole of searching and longing and wondering and waiting filled with peace, with purpose. And one of my new favorite words, destiny. Whoever believes in Jesus won't perish, but will have eternal life. And I love verse 17. We often skip it. If you grew up in church like I did, um, I learned this Bible verse in the King James Version way, way back in the day. But I only learned John 3.16. It's like the favorite, right? I mean, even Tim Tebow puts that on his face or used to when he played, played football. I mean, it's all over the place. You can't go to a sporting event without seeing it. It's all over t-shirts. But John 3.17 is equally as important because it reveals the heart of this patient, seeking, saving, savior. So let me read it to you. For God didn't send his son in the war, into the world to tell the world how bad we are, to point out all of our flaws, to put his sandal on our neck and tell us that we don't belong. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save it, to restore it, to complete it through him because he doesn't want anything from you, except you. He wants everything for you. And friends, God doesn't help those who can help themselves. He only steps in when we acknowledge that we're helpless. That's me. I'm a sinner saved by grace, just through my own faith, receiving the free gift of eternal life that God gave me through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Let me show you a few verses here. Let's talk about this. And we're almost done with this section. So pay attention. The Bible tells us that all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory, which unites all of humanity, that we're all born sinful. I said last week at the very beginning of my sermon, or my teaching, I don't, I don't like the word sermon. I don't know, our time together. I said, life is a sexually transmitted terminal disease. And everybody's like, what was the pastor talking about? You know, that, that's weird. But it's true, right? The moment you're born, you begin to die. 
But the moment we're born, the reason that we begin to die is because all of us have been cursed. We're all born sinful. And is it Adam and Eve's fault? Yeah, but you and I have done a great job to contribute to that. One sin, a million sins, somebody who has some omissions, somebody who's a serial killer, different consequences, different effect on society, spiritually still all born sinful. The Bible says all of sin, all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. Sin and suffering unite us all for the wages of sin. What do we deserve? Death. But the gift of God is eternal life. Where? Through Christ Jesus, our Lord. That's why we talk about Jesus over and over and over again. When I was in Northern California, I was, we started a church and the, the church there was in an area where 98 and a half percent of the people who uh, lived in this, this little county there, the southern part of the county, they didn't go to church. And most people had never even heard these stories. They didn't, had never even heard some of the most basic Bible stories that, that you and I take for granted. And after I had, had taught for several months, there was a, a guy, a very, very smart guy who was listening to everything very skeptically. And he finally came up and he said, Pastor, he said, Rick, when are you gonna stop talking about Jesus and talk about something else? And I said, man, I got nothing else to talk about. The old part, right? Season one points toward Jesus, the Old Testament. Season two points back toward Jesus, the New Testament. What are we doing looking forward to Jesus? We're, then here, we're talking about Jesus and his life. And then over here in this end of season two, we're talking about what we do and how we live based on Jesus. But Jesus and Jesus alone gives us this free gift of eternal life. God demonstrated his love for us that while we were still sinners, before we helped ourselves, without having to clean up our life, Christ died for us. And then finally, if we declare with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. You can become a follower of Christ. For it's with your heart that you believe and are justified and with your mouth that you profess and are saved. But we have to choose to give ourselves to Jesus because the thing about Jesus is he's a gentleman. I mean, God's strong, all powerful, knows everything, is everywhere. He could just snatch us up out of our own free will and say, you're gonna be a Christian no matter what. But there's this problem that's called the problem of praiseworthiness and God desires to be worshiped and loved voluntarily. So he affords us the opportunity to choose and he extends the opportunity to all of us. But there comes a time where we say, I'm in. Now, the cool thing about Jesus and when we listen to Jesus talk about his followers is that yes, there's a mental understanding of who Jesus is and there's a declaration of intent with their life. But I mean, Jesus literally, as he was going through his life and he's busy doing Jesus things, would look around and he would go, ah, oh, there's John, my follower, because he was right there. He would look back behind him and he would say, there's Peter, my follower. And, and a couple of times in the New Testament, he would say things that were just heartbreaking and he would say, and these disciples chose to follow me no more. So I want to explain to you very quickly, I want to be super clear how it is we become a follower of Jesus. It's the difference kind of between um, dating somebody and committing to get married. Now, I'm not trying to get in your romantic business. I'm just using an analogy, an illustration. I got married 32 years ago. I'm on my fourth wedding ring, my first wife. Uh, lose wedding rings. Um, it's one of those things that Joy just quit caring about, right? You can't be sentimental if you lose four of them. You lose one, you get in trouble. You lose the next one, it's like buy a cheap one next time, right? That's the way it works. But I wear this because I made a commitment. And there was a time when I stood before God, my dad, who was officiating the wedding, my friends, and I declared my intention. takes time for us, a specific intention, a decision to follow Jesus. And it's a prayer, but I don't want you to get weirded out by it. Have you ever done anything and all of a sudden you realize, hey, I'm pretty good at that. I had no idea I had a skill. Maybe you haven't. It doesn't happen to me often. But sometimes I'm like, yeah, I got a knack for that. I promise you, if you try to pray, people are like, I had no idea that was in there. 
But you know what? I kind of have a knack for it. It's not because you're good at it. It's because God put it in there and you just didn't know until you tried. But the first thing we have to do is we have to agree with God that all of us have sinned, that I've sinned, and that my sin, the wages of my sin, what I deserve is hell. And I have to ask forgiveness for my sins. God, I'm sorry I've sinned. Will you forgive me for my sin? I don't wanna sin anymore. Thoughts, actions, attitudes, displeasing to you. I need you, I don't need me. I confess my sins, forgive me. The second thing is that we tell God in this new way of thinking, right, that you can pray. It's just a thought you think toward God. No King James English necessary. You don't have to know Shakespeare. You just talk. That you believe who Jesus is. And friends, you know enough about Jesus just from what I've told you today, but I'm gonna tell you some more in case this is your first Sunday here with us. Jesus is 100% God who came to earth as a little baby and became 100% God and 100% man. And he lived a perfect life for about 33 years. For three years of that life, the last three, begin to teach this, this new way, this gospel, this good news available to all. At the end of that three years, since there was a price that had to be paid for our sin, a debt we couldn't pay, something we owed, Jesus took on that curse and allowed himself to be put on the cross and became the sacrifice necessary for me to be free from what I deserve because of the way I was born and what I've done a pretty good job to accumulate over time. And the third thing is, is that I have to say, you know what? I'm putting on the ring. I am gonna follow you. You're the boss. I believe you got a plan for me. I've seen my plan for me, not impressed. I want your plan for me. I'm gonna be your follower. And tomorrow, when you turn around, you're gonna see me right there, Jesus. And in 32 years, you're gonna see me, Jesus. Because this is what I've decided that I'm gonna do with my life. And if you give me another 32 years, God, my dying breath, I'll be right there. Because friends, it's the only thing in life that makes life worth anything. So, if you've never made the decision to follow Jesus, I wanna be absolutely clear how it is we do it. Because sometimes we make it really, really difficult and sometimes we make it weird. I wanna encourage you, if you want to become a follower of Christ, you simply tell God in your thoughts, in your own words, these simple things. And you mean it as best you're able. And the Bible tells us that God's spirit, the Holy Spirit comes and lives within you and begins to give you strength and direction in this life, sealing your salvation, making you part of God's spiritual family. He doesn't leave us the same as the way he found us. We begin to grow. Well, we're gonna sing a few songs and these songs are, are prayers from our mouth to God's ears. They're gonna prepare us for a time of communion, the Lord's Supper. And I'll explain it to you a little bit more in just a minute. But I want you to use this time, these three songs as a time of response. Because the last thing I would want for you, because I love you and I consider us friends, is for you to leave today without confirming the fact that you are a follower of Jesus Christ. I want us so badly to be in this family together. And if you choose to make that decision, would you do me a favor and would you let me know? I promise you, I'm not gonna get in your business and I'm not gonna put you on a mailing list and traffic your personal information. I'm your friend 
And I wanna help you get started on the right foot. I wanna pray with you and talk with you. It'd be an honor and a privilege. Father, as we go into- You may wonder what happened to old Nicodemus. Um, he had to get out of his, his own head because he was really used to being good at religion. And the reality of being a follower of Christ is, is that we're not really good at it. it reminds me of a couple of weeks ago, we had a little bit of snow that came down and um, I don't know, maybe an inch, not a lot. And my wife, Joy, uh, doesn't like to drive in the snow. As a matter of fact, she has a, uh, an aversion to snow. Anything white coming from the sky, uh, generally she'll call me or an Uber and get, try to get a ride somewhere. I said, Joy, you've been in Iowa six and a half years. You've got, or six years, you've got to learn to drive in the snow. You have to. It's like a, a responsibility of any Iowa woman. And she said, okay, I'm going to try to drive to church. I'm going to try. She has an all-wheel drive Honda Pilot. I mean, uh, and, and so she's, I'm going to try to do it. I'm going to do it. And so she did. She made it all the way to church. I checked on her, you know, tracked her on the phone and everything. No problem. Great. She came home. She got all the way home and she came in and she was so excited. And she said, Rick. And I said, what? She goes, I use my four wheel drive. And I said, what, what do you mean you used your four wheel drive? She goes, I was driving. And, and it went rear, 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 like that. And she was making these noises. And I said, that's not four wheel drive. I said, I think that's anti-lock brakes. But she was so excited because she had successfully made a trip to church and back. Now, I didn't criticize her and go, you should go drive through some snow and figure out how to be a real Iowan. I was excited because she got out of her own head and she started taking some steps to do something that scared her a little bit. And she knew that she needed to learn. Well, Nicodemus did the same thing. And you may ask how I know, because he showed up again as a member of the Sanhedrin when Jesus was being tried in his mock trial, it's illegal, unethical. But Nicodemus speaks up and he says, why don't you let Jesus speak for himself? How do we condemn a man until we've heard from him? It's like, huh, interesting interjection. Which side's he on? Well, hours after his interjection, after Jesus' crucifixion, when his body was being prepared for burial, we see two people who were there preparing Jesus' body for burial. And who do you think one of them was? Nicodemus. It may have taken him a little while to get out of his head. It may have taken him a little while to humble himself and be willing to not be great at something but then yet to realize that there's so many of us that don't think we're very good at it either, but committed to help each other become people with uncommon faith. Let me pray for you. Thank you for being here. Um, and this has been a lot of fun. Father, thank you for my friends. And our